six. So um, just a, a quick recap. Last week we looked at um, really, I told you last, I thought two weeks ago, was one of my, we were going to be looking at one of my favorite passages, my favorite chapters in all the Bible, uh, in Mark 5. Love that chapter. Um, it records a lot of Jesus' mighty works, right? We saw several miracles. Um, really, his encounter with, uh, and, and miracles with, uh, involving three specific people, where he was kind of this restorer of life, right? With, uh, we saw him go into the tombs and, and heal legion. Or not really, you know, cast the cast the legion out, I should say. Uh, we saw him heal uh, the woman with the issue of blood, and then um, we saw him raise uh, Jairus's daughter. And watching Jesus restore all these folks to life, um, I think, really left us as we left here last week. Kind of, uh, I know for me, it moved us to this place of awe. And the lingering question that we talked about, um, if we said. If there's one question that hangs over the entire book of Mark that he's looking to answer, what is it? Three words. Who is Jesus? And sometimes Mark gets accused of having a low Christology or a low um, opinion or viewpoint of Jesus. Um, because he doesn't go into great detail in writing about the greatness or maybe better, the godness of, of Jesus, but rather um, it's actually quite the opposite. That Mark has a grand Christology, but he chooses to show us, to tell us stories rather than tell us uh, in great detail. So when we wrapped up last week, uh, we could kind of feel the tension building. The way back in chapter 3, we had this um, encounter with the Jewish religious leaders who were very actively um, pushing back against Jesus, rejecting him, uh, even went as far to say that the power in which he was doing his miracles was from the devil. Um, and from there, um, from that rejection, we, we, Jesus kind of um, begins to teach and begins to perform miracles. Um, where he's beginning to reveal his identity even further and further, in particular to his disciples. But we can feel that kind of tension building over the last few weeks. Um, it's just like, uh, as we looked at miracle after miracle after miracle last week, it's like, okay, something is happening. Like, there's going to be, what's the next encounter going to be? What's the next profession of Jesus going to be? And from... Um, from Mark uh, showing us last week the teaching and the mighty works, kind of one after another, you can get that sense as the story unfolds, we're about to get another, another climax. Somebody's about to make another declaration about who Jesus is based on these events and these miracles. And that's kind of where we pick up in chapter 6. So we get to Mark 6, chapter 1, uh, and it says, He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. Now where was Jesus' hometown? Yes. It doesn't say that in the text. How would you guys know that? Well, he's called Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> yeah, so he's referred to as Jesus of Nazareth, but really in chapter 6, the only place you'll read Nazareth is if your Bible has headings, probably. Mm -hmm. um, but we do know from, from multiple occasions, both in Mark and without Mark, that Jesus was um, bo uh, called out of Nazareth, grew up in Nazareth, was not born in Nazareth, born in Bethlehem, but was raised and reared in Nazareth. Um, so he goes home, uh, and while it isn't explicit again in the text, um, we know that Jesus has been ascribed to have grown up in Nazareth over and over again. His family is there, obviously. He's recognized by all the people there, um, his neighbors, <clears throat> his relatives. And like was his custom, when he went into a town, he made Nazareth no different. When it was a Sabbath, he would go in and teach in a local synagogue. And his friends and neighbors, they hear his teaching, and they hear uh, him speak, and they're astonished, right? That, as we've seen before in his ministry, there are two things that kind of amaze people about Jesus, and it's typically uh, his wisdom and his miracles. And that's the case here again. Uh, we use that, we see that word astonished in, in regards to how people perceive the way he teaches and the works that he does. Um, in Jewish terms, recognizing Jesus as a teacher of wisdom means he's speaking as someone who's giving a revelation of God. And we don't get great insight yet into the miracles that are the referred to early early here in the first four verses or so. Whether he showed up in Nazareth and did a few works and then taught, whether um, he he taught in the, the works that we're kind of referring to, about the acts from his hand um, here in these first four verses are just things they've heard that he had done. Um, but nevertheless, um, not only are they uh, astonished, um, <clears throat> but they're uh, offended, right? So... It, they can't believe that Jesus is uh, that this Jesus is teaching with authority and wisdom and doing mighty acts with his hands. 
Um, they ask, how can this be? Like, this, aren't, aren't these his brothers and sisters? Is he not the carpenter's son? Isn't he the son of Mary? But uh, the friends and neighbors here in Nazareth aren't the only ones that, the, that we find are astonished. Um, Mark gives us kind of a play on words that the people of Nazareth um, are astonished by Jesus' teaching and power. But Jesus is also astonished. What is he astonished by? Their lack of faith. Yeah, so we're kind of going through chapter 6. We've got these six small stories. Um, and there's a, a real sense in which Mark begins and closes with um, a, a group of people or a town's response to Jesus. And off the bat, we see Jesus come home to his hometown, um, the place where he grew up, the place where there are the people he loves, uh, family and friends and relatives, um, and teaches in his local synagogue. And the people there are um, astonished and yet um, not in the way that we gives us a, a positive uh, affirmation, right? Like they're, they're offended. Who does, almost to say, who does this guy think he is? Um, or do you know, think you're better than us? Kind of type of, type of thing. So um, the people of Nazareth are astonished by Jesus to the point where they almost take offense at what he's doing. Um, and then I think but the, the bigger question here, um, Jesus kind of um, doesn't shrug this off, but he kind of, he kind of gives a little proverb there about a prophet being, uh, prophet has honor everywhere except in his home country. And then he decides, um, as he typically does, when he's asked to leave, he moves on. Or if he's not accepted somewhere, he tends to move on rather quickly. Um, but the, they make note before that Jesus moves on, right, that he couldn't do many works there. Other than lay a few hand, hands on a few sick people, Jesus didn't do. And I think that's kind of uh, one of the questions worth exploring here, right, in this chapter or in this beginning story is why couldn't Jesus do great works in Nazareth like he'd done other places? Any ideas? In the previous chapter, the people had great faith who came up to him. And so, like, the woman said, you know, who was healed of her bleeding disorder, you know, she said, if I just touch his cloak, I will be healed. And Jairus, who had, you know, great, just great faith. And the people in Nazareth did not. Yeah, so in the last, you know, verse 5 and verse 6, there's this definite connection between him not being able to do many works there in their unbelief. Um, and it does lay on the backdrop of chapter 5 where you see such great faith, and we'll look at that in, in, uh, towards the end. Um, but then that, asks, that kind of further begs the question, does that mean that God's power is held captive to our faith? Can God only do miraculous things if and when we believe? It's not limited. Yeah. He did all kinds of things when the Israelites didn't believe when he was yeah. coming out of Egypt. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, the proper answer is probably, of course, not right. That there are people who, uh, even today, who, who reject, who don't believe, who hate God uh, passionately every single day, and yet they live and move and breathe by his grace as recipients of the mir miracle that is life. But Mark is making a point, and his point isn't that... Um, Jesus, uh, his, his miracles are, are definitely bound to their faith. Um, when I was in college, um, I ended up joining, when I went to college, my first semester was um, the spring semester. So I showed up in January, not knowing anybody, not having any friends. Um, so the first time anybody asked me to do anything extracurricular, I jumped on it. And there was a guy, he was dressed in a really nice suit. He's like, do you wanna go to a concert with me? So I went to the, I said, sure. So I went to this concert and, um, as uh, somewhere in the middle of this concert, um, people started coming forward and they were, they were doing um, some prayer and some things. And in the middle of all that prayer, um, someone had brought forth a little girl that they laid hands on and prayed. And she had a, I think it was, a, it was a rare kind of almost like cancer of the blood. And they prayed for her and they, um, I think they anointed her with oil and so on and so forth and um, pretty kosher stuff up until um, one of the speakers, one of the musicians kind of took the mic and said, now this girl has this disease and her prognosis is not great, but if she has enough faith, she'll be healed. And I was like, oh, like, that devastated me to put that on that little girl and her family, right? Um, and that's not what Mark is teaching here. But he is trying to make a point, right? 
Now we're coming off this story, as Sue is mentioning, of two mir- uh, or, uh, several miracles, two in particular at the end of chapter 5 that were applauded for having great faith, right? Um, Mark 5, 34 and 36 with the healing of the woman with the issue of blood and the raising of Jairus' daughter. And um, those are great um, <clears throat> miracles that were preceded by um, really moving faith. And just as I think Mark wanted to show us that faith has positive effects and power when it's present, so does the absence of faith uh, hinder the manifestation of God's power. I think Mark wanted to portray that a lack of faith has negative consequences. Um, It's not really his purpose to say that a lack of faith completely ties God's hands. Uh, We don't believe that to be true, but rather indicates that that the receptivity to God, which we would call faith, is rewarded by God's power, And there are also likewise opposite consequences in the absence of faith. So um, that's kind of something we're going to continue to see as we build this chapter. Like where there's faith, there is um, the freedom of God's power to move and provide and act. And um, throughout Mark, we will see many folks respond differently to Jesus. And the Nazareth, the people of Nazareth are just one response. Like we've been building up, we're ready for someone to make a proclamation about Jesus. And we get here and it's actually not one we were hoping for, right? They reject Jesus. Um, and each of these people who uh, make a decision about Jesus, um, specifically those who rejected him, they all kind of came in with their own, they come in with their own hurdles to belief. What was the hurdle of belief or the hurdle for faith for the people of Nazareth? What hindered them? Their knowledge of him for so many years? No matter how astonished they were, they couldn't get past his humble and familiar origins among them. And throughout our life, we're going to encounter many people with many different obstacles. Our job is to be continually faithful in presenting them the gospel and let God remove the barriers. Um, But there is a caution, and we'll get into this again later, about putting God in, in our own box. And kind of saying, we, this is what I believe Jesus can do. And kind of limiting him to that. This is the Jesus I'm familiar with. with and this is the one I'm comfortable with. But um, there is, um, yeah, coming up in Mark, um, I guess we're kind of watching, again, we talked about a few weeks ago, the disciples' faith unfold. Um, so that's going to be fascinating to kind of watch and, and see and kind of unravel in light of this. That they are kind of, oh, it's opening up before their eyes who Jesus is. And we get to so we get to sit and explore that um, as they kind of come to overcome their hurdles. And we'll talk about what those are. Um, any questions about Nazareth before we move on? I just want to hit on that story real quick. Because we have other longer stories. Mark 6, 7 then. Uh, and he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. Now, um, we've talked a few times about a Markin sandwich, right? Um, tonight we get another Markin sandwich um, where Mark starts a story, then he interrupts it with another story, and then he comes back and finishes. So we start the beginning of the story, you know, that first slice of bread in our Markin sandwich is the disciples being sent out, the apostles being sent out. We saw a few chapters back um, that Jesus had selected 12 disciples or 12 apostles that he was going to send out. And we talked about their ministry was going to be threefold, uh, similar to how Jesus' ministry started out as his threefold ministry of, of teaching or preaching, casting out demons, and healing the sick. By giving the apostles this authority over evil spirits, Mark is really showing us that they are going to be an extension um, in, in the not too distant future, a continuation of Jesus' ministry, of his own power and his own ministry. Um, when Jesus first started out, his ministry, when we opened in Mark 1 and 2, we saw the same thing. Teaching, preaching, um, healing the sick, casting out demons. Now we get to Mark 6 and we see that has come to fruition. And it's time for the disciples or the apostles to be sent out. And but before doing so, Jesus gives them some instructions. Um, first, he makes sure that they are going out two by two. What's the purpose behind that? To have a witness and accountability. Both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, and later, Mark will, will talk about the disciples' ministry as being a sharing of the testimony of Jesus. But it was, it's, it's given as a, a wise principle, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, to 
uh, receive a testimony based on at least two witnesses. So um, you have that. <clears throat> Additionally, going out in pairs is safer, um, and you also have some uh, natural encouragement, um, which, is, which is important if you're going to be uh, a missionary or in ministry. Uh, his instruction to the apostles was to take nothing with them except a staff. They were not to take bread or money. He told them to wear sandals. He told them not to take two tunics. Um, he says, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. So a few kind of don't seem to go together, these instructions that don't seem to connect. Um, but when, he, when he's talking about, okay, don't take bread, don't take money, don't take weapons, uh, only take one tune. What is he, what, what kind of position is Jesus putting them in? Peaceful one? Maybe. Dependence. Dependence. Yeah. yeah. Reliance, dependence. So, you know, um, not all these things are super clear, but with the tunic, I think it's widely agreed upon that um, if you had two tunics, um, you typically did that for warmth. And so if they were out, they wouldn't have to go into somebody's house. They could sleep on the ground and keep their warmth. And, you know, Jesus wants them relying on others. He wants them in homes. He has very clear instructions about when they go to a home, how to handle that. Um, by remaining in the first home, the disciples are tempted, uh, not tempted to find better accommodations. It also prevents jealousy in those who come to hear their preaching and then would want them to come and host, be a host instead. Uh, but Jesus instructs them to stay put. It puts them in a position where they are dependent upon the hospitalities of other, hospitality of others. And we could go on a tangent there about making sure we're ready to be uh, hospitable for ministers and missionaries. Um, but uh, ultimately, as we said earlier, we're putting them in a position of reliance and a position of trust. <clears throat> and who are they to trust as they go? God, right? They're supposed to trust that God will take care of them and provide their needs. He says, if any place won't receive you, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So pious Jews were known to shake off their robes uh, when leaving a Gentile town, so as to kind of protect themselves from the uncleanliness of the Gentiles. Um, they don't want to be contaminated by false beliefs. So by shaking the dust from their feet, the apostles, uh, or the twelve, would show that the Jews, because um, they're only going into Jewish towns at this time, that the Jews who reject Jesus' message are just as lost as the Gentiles who don't know God at all. And they testify that um, the people have chosen a different path and the 12 are not responsible for their choices. So um, some symbolic meaning behind shaking off their shoes. Um, you still might have some people that come to your door and shake off their shoes when you don't let them in. If you've ever had Jehovah Witnesses come by, they yeah, still do this as well. So, yeah. Um, so uh, the emphasis in addition to their teaching and their training for the disciples is trust. Overall, it's a trust that God will provide their needs. There's also they're trusting that God will uh, work through you, that you're not responsible for those who reject you, or you're not responsible to, to be perfect or to minister perfectly, but trust that God will work with the seeds that you've planted, um, which is calling into recollection the first parable we looked at. So when they went out proclaiming this message of repentance, they did this, they cast out many demons, they anointed with oil many who were sick. And this is a... This is a monumental occasion for the disciples. Um, that we talked in the beginning about when they were selected that none of these men had had the privilege or ever expected the opportunity to apprentice under a rabbi. They never imagined participating in the work of the kingdom. Um, so this is, this is huge for them. Uh, when I was, <clears throat> when I was 18, I got elected, um, so our church belonged to an association or a network of churches. This is not City of God. This is when I lived in Ohio. Uh, and I was elected the uh, evangelist for this network of churches. So we had churches in Indiana, Michigan, West Virginia, Ohio. And um, that just meant whenever one of these churches in the area needed somebody to fill the pulpit or wanted somebody to come and preach a special service or just come for any old reason, um, they would call me and I would travel there. And um, I loved it. You, you drive from town to town. You show up. Um, you really only need one or two sermons because you're just preaching somewhere different all the time. Everyone is so welcoming. They're so excited to see you. Um, 
they put a little money in your pocket and a whole lot of food in your belly and they kind of send you on your way. And it's just like, I thought that I was like, man, this is, this is, ministry is awesome. This is just the best. Um, and if Mark didn't, if Mark went from the disciples being sent out to their story of when they returned, we would look at that and be like, ministry is pretty awesome. Like everyone should do this. And I'm not saying everyone shouldn't, but there are two sides of it, right? So this is why Mark interjects here, because it seems very random, but he says, you're going to go and you're going to do great things. You're going to come back and you're going to tell me about those great things and experience more great things. But you got to know that faithfulness to Jesus and ministry doesn't always look like sunshine day in and day out, right? And we get back to this, he interjects with the story of John the Baptist. We've already met John the Baptist at the beginning of Mark, right? He was that forerunner of Christ, that Elijah type, crying out in the wilderness, getting the people's hearts ready for the preaching of repentance and by baptizing, getting people ready to receive Jesus's message. When we get to verse 14, we get the meat of the sandwich. We've looked a few times already. Again, he starts a story and interrupts us. So now he interjects in this story, the death of John the Baptist. Again, we started with John the Baptist, but John was sent to prepare the way of Jesus. He preached repentance and baptism. He laid that path. And then we read here that he ended up in prison that he ended up in prison under the order of King Herod because he'd spoken out against Herod's message, or excuse me, not message, marriage to Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. So Antipas is the son of Herod the Great, and um, I don't know if it's Maltes or Maltes. Herod the Great was of Edomite descent, uh, and Maltes was a Samaritan. And at the time, Jewish folks disliked both of those groups of people, and the fact that Herod's family was installed by Roman leadership didn't help. So in our homework, we talked a little bit about um, kind of that family tree of Herod the Great. So Herod the Great um, ruled during Jesus's birth, kind of that king of uh, Judea, Galilee, and a couple other places. I'm not going to butcher their names, but I'm sure they're really nice this time of year. He ruled during Jesus's birth. Uh, we read about it in Matthew chapter 2. Um, and then we have uh, Herod Archelaus, or Laius, I should say, Herod Antipas, Herod Philip I, Herod Philip II, uh, Herod Agrippa I, and then Herod, Herod Agrippa II, um, all of which we read in other places, some more than others, in the New Testament. I think in the Homer we looked at who? We looked at Herod the Great, Herod Antipas, and Agrippa, was it two or one? Was it Acts 12 or Acts 25? 12. Okay, so we looked at Agrippa 1. Just by chance, did anyone notice anything about this family? Is there, their story runs pretty deep alongside the New Testament. Do you notice any similarities? Other than the name. <laughs> the name? They feel very threatened by anything having to do with Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, they're very, they're very threatened. Um, they often meet, whether it's John or Jesus or Paul, with intrigue, but um, and sometimes fear, but not not a reverence. They do feel very threatened. Um, there is always that fear of a Jewish escalation of overthrowing the Roman government. Um, and even if you didn't have a successful revolt, um, just the revolt could, could remove you from power. Also, in the situation we're reading about today with Antipas, um, his taking of this other man's wife kind of started a war so he couldn't have one war going on in the south and another war going with uh the you know a jewish revolt so yeah um and they weren't afraid to act on those threats like not, uh, when they felt threatened they weren't afraid to act out on it right um whether that's Herod the great with uh um with matthew 2 and around jesus's birth or um herod who killed James and had him put to death in Acts 12 like they, were, they weren't afraid of, of persecuting or throwing their weight around so to speak anything else you noticed about these they, they're at once feeling threatened and on the other hand trying to please people mm -hmm. so like trying to you know I want to get rid of Jesus but I also want to yeah. keep you people calm you know yeah, so there is a little bit of foreshadowing in, in the interaction between John the Baptist and, and Antipas because Jesus will come before Antipas as well. And 
he won't want to take action there. They all kind of take that Pontius Pilate approach of, um, or at least Antipas does, of, 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 of wanting to wash their hands of this. And not. Yeah. Um, and Antipas was kind of, I think, I mean, you don't want to read too much in the text, but I think there's a little bit of, I don't know, not little brother syndrome, but he called himself king, but he wasn't really a king. Um, it's more, I think the correct term would have been tetrarch, but I think he called himself king. But anyway, um, scripture tells us um, that he arrested John the Baptist. Were his motives completely impure in arresting John the Baptist? Was it just to be mean to John? Or to persecute John? Not exact, exactly. Um, so, uh, as part of John's message of repentance, you let to love this about John, right? He wasn't afraid to call out um, the inappropriate relationship that the political leader, that the king was having at the time. And can you imagine that somebody preaching against the immorality of political leaders? It's wild. But John was doing it. He said, this, this marriage is illegitimate. It's incestuous. You're related. Um, and he denounces it. And John's words infuriated uh, Herodias, Antipas' wife. Um, but Antipas knows, okay, John is a righteous man. He fears him. He's intrigued. He likes to listen to John. So since Herodias is trying to kill John, his way of protecting John is to hold him in prison, which is really the only place his wife can't reach him. Um, thinking this will maybe uh, uh, presume, presumably appease his wife. The historian Josephus writes that Antipas initially refused to put John the Baptist to death um, for fear that John's followers would revolt. The tradition of Jews rising up against uh, Roman oppressors, as we talked about before, is a long one. And there was always this story lingering of a coming Messiah who would su uh, succeed, um, and that Jews were always talking about a Messiah that was going to come and establish a kingdom. So with that lingering, he didn't want to put John the Baptist to death. Refused it, I think, probably on more than one occasion. But eventually, he does put John to death because he makes a quick and silly oath. Right? How does that come? To, how does that come to happen? It's his trying birthday. To, trying to please other people, and he was tempted again with his eyes, and mm -hmm. everyone enjoyed seeing his stepdaughter, mm -hmm. or is it his daughter? I can't remember. Stepdaughter, daughter. niece, daughter, stepdaughter. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Actually, it was his niece, wasn't it? I could be wrong. I mean, technically yeah, both. Technically like, both. Yeah, yeah technically sorry. Both. Yes, that's <laughs> right. Yeah. So, anyways, and uh, because of the joy he got from that, he gave in to another thought of, I'm going to please everyone here and yeah. make an example. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so he's surrounded by all these, um, all these uh, leaders for his birthday, um, fellow tetrarchs from the area, other uh, military individuals um, and his his daughter Dan is whatever she is <laughs> she dances in a way that's pleasing to the point where uh, he even um, and I, most people see this as kind of him speaking um, in a joking manner like even up to half my kingdom um, so she goes to her mother Herodias and obviously she asks for what she wants the most uh, which is the head of John the Baptist so uh, in that moment I think despite his desire not to, uh, fulfills that oath, uh, and John is executed. And um, Mark kind of puts this in there, and there's, again, there's a lot of foreshadowing. You know, Jesus will be arrested in a similar fashion. He'll stand before Antipas. Um, he'll have a mock trial like John had, and eventually he'll um, be executed, um, not in the exact same way, obviously, but in a way that he doesn't deserve. And we say all that, that when Jesus gives his disciples instructions before they go out in Matthew 10, Matthew records um, a long warning, just, just so you know what you're getting into to the disciples about persecution and about how you'll be delivered over, over for trial and persecutions and, they, and they'll kill you and they'll beat you and they'll flog you for my name's sake. And then he closes with this. He says, a disciple is not, a, this is Matthew 10, 24, a disciple is not above his teacher nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they had called the master, if they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So we'll get in. Mark will explain this even further down the road a little bit when he talks about what it means to follow Jesus. 
But even right here, we recognize that the call to follow Jesus, we want to serve him, we want to be one of his ministers in this world. Um, the call to discipleship is, is, is a call to walk in all the steps of Jesus, even the hard ones, even the suffering, right? And it'd be really great if the only footsteps we had to follow were the ones that went, you know, over the waves or um, uh, into the temple, into the synagogue. Like those, are, those are great, but I mean, Jesus is... Uh, footsteps led him to the poorest of poor areas and the sickest of sick and um, the hardest of hearts and the uh, eventual suffering and persecution. And he said, Mark says, we're going to get way out here and think being an apostle or being a disciple is, is all going to be sunshine and rainbows. He's like, let me interject with this point. He wants to draw our attention to it. We also get a lot of his, you know, a lot of the historical data there for what happened to John. So, uh, any questions about that section about John the Baptist? Do we see why it's why Mark sandwiched it in like that? So, Mark starts with the disciples are being sent out. Pause. John the Baptist. Remember, discipleship is also hard. And then verse 30 picks up. We have that? No. Verse 30 picks up and it brings, uh, in, in verse 30, it brings us back to the disciples uh, returning from being sent out to minister. Um, it says in verse 30 of chapter 6, the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And Jesus' response to that is, hey, come away by yourself to a desolate place and let's rest a while. We've talked a bit before about Jesus having this rhythm of life that is rest and return, rest and return. And after the disciples have ministered for a while now, he attempts to get them to do the same. That Jesus is, again, very actively trying to tend to their needs and take care of them. In the text, the way Mark reads is that they made an effort to get to a desolate place where they could rest, but it doesn't work out the way they planned, right? Um, that many people, the Bible says, a great crowd noticed them. They went ahead of them, and by the time they get to that place that they were thinking was going to be desolate, um, they beat them there. The crowd beats them there, almost awaits their arrival, is the way that Mark kind of describes that. And then we get to verse 34 of chapter 6. He says, When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. When we come to that verse, and it says that Jesus had compassion on them, what does compassion mean there? Care about their need. You cared about what? Their need for a savior, for rescue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what? When Jesus says compassion, it means a little bit more than I think we kind of talk about. Are there any indications of that in the text? Does Jesus look at the crowd and say, Thoughts and prayers will be going down. No. Um, my penmanship is not great with Greek. It's second only to my pronunciation. But what Jesus is, has here going on is a lot more than a feeling or an emotion. Um, Splunk zomai is one of my favorite words in the New Testament. Um, It's a movement of the bowels. It's okay to giggle. It's not what you're thinking. Uh, it's, a, it's a movement in the bowels. It's used about a dozen times in the New Testament. And uh, it's a deep, deep, deep feeling uh, it's a yearning associated with compassion. And in Bible times, 
um, both Old Testament especially and even New Testament, the seed of emotions was not the heart as we think of it today, but it was the bowels. We talk about, maybe you think about having um, your stomach drop or having butterflies in your stomach. Um, but this is where they thought the seed of emotions rested, that it was not just a, a feeling, but it was an action. Um, this first part of this word, splunk, is, uh, is where we get our word spleen from. So it's talking about, you know, way in there, right? And we get this word here for deep compassion, and we see that uh, Jesus is moved deeply, but not just towards a feeling alone, but it's a feeling that makes him act. He, he can't help, like if this is, if, if I can't help but do anything about this. Like it's this feeling that I have in my bowels is not going to move unless we do something. We have something here uh, every other year or so. We have Compassion Sunday. We do it by, uh, uh, we, we partner with Compassion International. We show you all the kids around the world in need. <coughs> and our hope is that, not just that you, um, we, get, we get some folks who, who look at that and, and, and feel bad for those kids or, um, or have a feeling towards them, even not just thoughts and prayers, although we definitely always want to be, believe there's power in prayer and we want to pray for them, but we want people to actively have compassion by helping them, by taking up aid and, and sending money and, and, and those kind of things. And that's, I think, why they call themselves Compassion International. They're wanting you to have a, a just to be so deeply moved that we act. And that's what Jesus is saying here. It's interesting, though, the, the, the words he uses to describe this. He says he's, he sees them as sheep without a shepherd. And that's actually, you can take that from a couple of different texts in the Old Testament. Most prominent, and I think the one Jesus is probably referring to, um, is in Numbers 27, where Moses is praying that God would send the successor. Someone to take over leadership of the people when he's gone. In Numbers 27, Moses spake to the Lord, saying... Spake. That's my KJV upbringing. <laughs> Moses spoke to the Lord, saying, "Let the Lord, the God of the uh, God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint a man over the congregation, who shall go out before them and come in before them, who shall lead them out and bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord may not be as a sheep that have no shepherd." So he doesn't want to see, uh, you know, Jesus' desire is not for anyone to be shepherdless. And he's moved with compassion for them. And the other uh, gospel writers will tell us that he uh, would lay hands and spend um, a long time there teaching. And Mark lets us know that he does spend a lot of time there teaching, that he stayed until the hour grew late. And the disciples begin to worry about what? Because they've been teaching so long to this crowd. Yeah. Um, one of the disciples, John will tell us later that it's Philip, um, that Jesus approaches Philip and asks him, like, hey, where can these people go and buy food? And it's actually Philip who makes the joke, and, and Mark records this as well, too, I believe, that kind of talks about 200 denarii, which would be 200 days worth, would not be enough to buy enough food for all these people and have them each get a little bit, right? Uh, and so they're very troubled about what they're going to do. And it's very interesting, John also notes because the question is like, okay, it's getting late. Just send them home. Well, John also notes that this is occurring during the Passover. And that most of these people are likely meeting Jesus for the first time, but have encountered the disciples along their way in their recent ministry um, and followed them back to Jesus. And are also probably headed maybe either to or fro the Passover celebration. And so they're travelers. So there is no going home and getting sustenance. So they're in a pickle, right? Um, so Jesus says, you know, go and see how many loaves you have. John tells us Peter is able to secure five fish and two loaves. Um, and the disciples uh, have this, and Jesus begins to sit, and he begins to break people down into groups of 50 and groups of 100. And he looked up to heaven, and he says a blessing, and he broke the loaves and gave the disciples um the food to feed the people and he divides the bread and he divides the fish among them and lo and behold everyone ate and was satisfied and there were even 12 full baskets full of broken pieces of bread and fish left at the end <clears throat> mark gives us three boat stories and three bread stories and we're in the second of both of them in this chapter and we know that they're significant, but it's not always, always clear what, he's, what he maybe wants to tell us in these. Um, but I think there's a few things we can draw from this. We know um, 
we know this miracle is very important. Um, there are two miracles recorded in all four Gospels. The resurrection and the feeding of 5,000. So this is significant, right? Um, and if you're, uh, one thing we should look for, I think we should probably have both a, an eye looking backward when we read the feeding of 5,000 and, and another eye looking uh, forward. Because when you're watching this in real time, if you're the disciples and um, you're seeing folks seated in groups and counted on a grassy plain in a desolate place and who are miraculously being fed bread, where's your mind going to go? Where did the baskets come from? That's what I asked. <laughs> <laughs> baskets and carrying around twelve baskets. <laughs> Mine goes back to manna when the Israelites are gathered around and God is feeding them. Mm -hmm. That's where my brain went first. Yeah, I think regardless of what else we we maybe see here, Jesus, and, and maybe maybe when we go through Matthew, this will be even clearer because he doesn't he does. He's very much more intentional, I think, than Mark in being like, hey, this is the second Exodus, one that's greater than Moses is here. Um, but Jesus is doing this. So if we were to flip over to, to Deuteronomy 34, um, so Joshua ended up being this successor. And, and I'm, um, but there's another passage in Deuteronomy 34, 10, that talks about... Um, God sending another prophet who he talked to face to face. And that didn't end up being Joshua. In fact, that never ended up being anyone. And this is why they come to Jesus and first John the Baptist and then Jesus and ask them, like, are you the one that they say is to come? That they're looking for that. And Jesus is kind of revealing that here, that the one who's greater than Moses is here. That the one you're looking for is here. Is that what we said? Mark is answering this question. Who is Jesus? And he's been doing this over and over again, showing us, giving us these examples of doing things that only God has done and can do. And he's revealing that in this feeding of 5,000 to draw their mind to the first Exodus. Remember when you came out on the other side and you were terrified of what was ahead of you. Even after all God had just brought you through, you're fearful of what's ahead and you kind of are asking to go back and you're beginning to wondering, is God really going to take care of me out all the way out here in the wilderness and, and through this? And Jesus is sitting there and he's, he's breaking bread and he's showing that, yeah, yeah. Like, I am the one you're waiting for. We'll dig into this in, in just a little bit. But the John also says this event occurs at Passover, right? And this is why they don't just send the people home to eat, that many are coming or going to Jerusalem, um, just like the hundreds of thousands of others who go there at this time to worship and celebrate uh, at the temple. But when John records the message, he records Jesus lifted the bread and gave thanks. And the word he uses there to give thanks um, is the same word we use for Eucharist. Um, so the miracle of the breaking of bread at Passover, Jesus is kind of foreshadowing um, a future miracle that he's going to do where his body, the bread, is broken and then a, a miraculous resurrection takes place that will provide them with ultimate satisfaction. So yeah, well, that's a big jump. From Mark, maybe, but we put the Gospels together, and John says that after um, the members, there are members of this crowd who ate, and after they ate, um, after the story of, we'll get into here in a minute, of them crossing the sea, um, they tried to track down Jesus later. And John says they came out, and they found Jesus. Uh, and Jesus tells them, he said, you're, <laughs> kind of funny, he said, you're only here because you ate all the bread. Like, you you got ate and had your, you had your fill. And he said, in, in John 6, 27, he says, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And the crowd was like, okay, like we want that eternal bread. What do we have to do to get it and to participate in the works you're doing? And Jesus says, you only have to believe in the one that God has sent. To which this crowd that just ate replies, well, will you give us a sign that we might believe? They said, they're like, our ancestors, they ate manna in the wilderness. And Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it's, it is not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they say, sir, give us 
this bread. Give us this eternal bread that when they're up to hunger again. And Jesus in verse 35 says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus said, in me is found eternal sustenance. That in me is found a life that can never be taken away. And that's very significant, considering where we're going with uh, uh, the story of the walking on the water here in a second. But before we get there, any questions about the disciples' ministry of the feeding of 5,000? Besides, I don't know where the baskets came from. I don't, I don't know where the baskets came from. But there were 12. And 12 Left tribes, over. And 12 yeah. disciples. Yeah. And 12 yeah. tribes. Um, there's not a ton. Like, I'm very careful with numbers in the Bible. I think it's good to have a certain awareness but not to be dogmatic about certain things. Yeah, there's a safe bet when we read about 12 baskets or 12 of anything. We're like, okay, disciples, tribes of Israel, I got it. I think there's significance in the disciples having to carry those. I think this is Jesus saying, this is how my ministry is going to go moving forward. Like, you're going to carry, you're going to minister to the people in this setting. I also think there's a little bit of irony in the disciples' lack of faith and how Jesus like, you have to carry these 12 baskets. Um, we need to think this would be possible. But um, as far as the five and two, I'm not ready to venture into what that might be or anything like that. Um, but going on, because verse 40, 45, we get Mark's, is it on here? We get Mark's favorite word, right? Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. Um, does anyone know, according to John's gospel, while Jesus got the disciples out of there in a kind of a hurried way? According to John's gospel, when he fed those people, they said, truly, you are the prophet to come. And Jesus says, it could sense that they were about to make him king by force. So he got the disciples out of there. Um, not because necessarily the disciples were, were going to necessarily fight or in, in harm or danger. I think it was more or less, we don't, I don't want you to see this um, and get any ideas beyond what you already have. But um, so he gets them in the boat and, and gets them out of immediately because, you know, they They've been out ministering on their own for, for I don't know how long and have barely had, you know, I guess they have enough to eat now. Anyway, they never got that rest. And before they could really get that rest, they get back in the boat. I think it's kind of funny here, at least the way Mark writes it. But anyway, um, he pushes them out into the uh, to go across the other side while he stays behind. And he dismisses the crowd. And after he'd taken uh, leave of them, he went up to the mountain to pray. So for some pretty significant time passed where Jesus was got alone to pray because um, evening came and the boat was out on the sea and he was alone on the land. And um, so we you know the disciples are out on the sea trying to make their way over. Jesus is on the land. The crowd is, is gone. And when evening came, Jesus was still on the land. Um, but he sees the disciples at some point during the night um, struggling to make it across the wind with the wind being against them. So sometime between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., uh, Jesus goes to them walking on the sea. Um and they see him and there's a lot of traditions around um, spirits and demons being present on the sea and, and so obviously they're they're scared at this point right they think it's a ghost um, but Jesus settles them and he says take note or take heart I should say it is I do not be afraid and he gets in the boat with them and the wind stops um, and then they begin to uh, have a, a conversation here in Mark uh, after he gets in the boat. And they saw them and they were terrified, but immediately he spoke to them and said, take heart as I do not be afraid. And he got in the boat with them and immediately the wind ceased and they were utterly astounded. And they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. And there's a lot going on in this passage that is like, I don't know exactly what's going on here. I can make, it would make sense for me for Jesus to rebuke them for not understanding one of the miracles which led to their fear in this moment. I would have guessed it would have been the first boat miracle. I, what's the correlation then between, why would they say, if you would have understood the loaves, you wouldn't have been afraid just now. What on earth does a miracle of the loaves uh, have to do with this occurrence? 
And there are several things that the apostles do not understand about the loaves or about anything that Jesus understand is this um, is it basic meaning. It just means that they, they are not able to analyze the evidence and come to a conclusion. That they're, they have this bias that we've seen repeatedly already that tells them Jesus is the Messiah coming to make their lives easier and richer. What they don't see is that Jesus isn't there to make them prosperous, but to give them exactly what they need. To give them what's in order for them to accomplish God's mission. And that's what we see over and over and over again in this passage, whether it's in the sending out or trying to get them to rest when they return or the provision of the food. Um, that Jesus is constantly just giving them exactly what they need. Um, but it says here they didn't understand about the loaves, that their hearts were hardened. Hard heart will always, will always calls us back to Pharaoh, right, in, in Exodus. And it just it simply means um, a hardened heart is, is where there's a lack of faith or unbelief. And that's where the disciples are right now, or where we are in this moment. They can't quite grasp um, who Jesus is on his terms, right? Any questions about the walking on the water? Sometimes it's easier to answer questions than just go straight through it. There's no way there's no questions about the Mount Gilmore. There's got to be. Well, I wondered why he was about to pass them by Thank instead God. of stopping. Yeah, I, <laughs> all right. That stuck out, and I read a little bit about it, and I thought it was the coolest. Yeah, so Jesus is going to cross the sea, and he doesn't want to be bothered by these guys. Like, they're taking forever. Um, I'm not getting in that boat where, you know, but that's not what it is. Like, he put them there. Once he's in the boat, they immediately end up at the other side. So what's going on with... What is, why, is it, why does it say that um, he was going to pass them by? Um, if you have a, a book of Job, um, it's a book we've not taught through here, not taught here yet, uh, whether on Sunday mornings or Bible study. It's one you have to be very careful with. You have to be very aware of who's speaking. Um, but anyway, one of Job's friends gives him some odd advice, and Job's kind of wrestling with how do I respond and he responds about you know who can who can be made right before God he's answering his friend talking about how um, how kind of there is no arbiter <coughs> at this time between God and man like he's so high I'm not going to be I can't negotiate with him and Job says this is a this is coming back to why did why did he pass by Job answered and said truly I know that it is so but how can man be right before God if one wished to contend with God, one could not answer him once in a thousand times. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength, who has hardened himself against him and succeeded. Rhetorical question. He who move, removes mountains, and they know it not, when he overturns them in his anger, who shakes the earth out of its place and its pillars tremble. Verse 7, who commands the sun and it does not rise, who seals up the stars. And verse 8, who alone stretch out the heavens and trample the waves of the sea. Verse 9, who made the bear and Orion, the uh, Pleiades and the chambers of the south, this font is so small. Verse 10, who does great things beyond searching out and marvelous things beyond number? And then verse 11, behold, he passes by me and I see him not. He moves on, but I do not perceive him. So Jesus' intention is not to be seen, but it's to pass by um, in the same sense in which Moses was on the mountaintop and um, wanted to see God, and God said, I can pass by. And um, one of the things that Jesus is getting at in these miracles, the thing Jesus is getting at in these miracles is his, um, is his deity. And there are some things that um, God gave his prophets, and even the disciples, the ability to do. To perform miracles in order to prove that their message was from him um, they healed they exercised demons they even raised the dead but there are a few miracles that the bible records of only god being able to do and one of those is walking on water and the other is giving sight to the blind um, so here we get jesus's confirmation who is he well he's the god who tramples over the waves so we asked, why is he passing by? It's not, I'm just going to leave them. It's he wanted to be seen. Um, I don't know that he wanted to stop, but he wanted to be seen. So then we get to 
the bookend, right? We said, um, oh, also, if you're familiar with the story of the walking on water from any of the Gospels, you're familiar by this point to know that Mark got all his information from who? Peter. John. Why is it left out? <laughs> Peter walked on water, gives Mark all the evidence, or all the notes for his letter and or his gospel, and yet we don't read anything about Peter walking on water. Because the book's about who Jesus is, not who Peter is. Yeah, I think that's one reason. Yeah, Mark is very emphatic. Jesus is the hero of the story. This, <laughs> he's very emphatic. The disciples are not. <clears throat> but yeah, it was also um, just a part of literary at that literature at that time if you were the author you're the storyteller you don't it was embarrassing to highlight yourself to see them if you were bragging so i think that's part of the reason um but anyway we get to the second book and we've seen how did the people of nazareth respond to jesus and now we get to there's really almost two market sandwiches here we close with um, the people of genesaret and their response to jesus that in verse 53 um he crosses over to Genesaret, and they got out of the boat. Now, this is not Jesus' first visit here, right? Uh, wait, excuse me. Um, how does Jesus, let me, let me rephrase that. How does Jesus's, how does the response to the people at Genesaret differ from the people in Nazareth? What I should say. That was the homework question, right? Yeah. Are they the exact same? Polar opposites. They want to get to him. They want to touch him and be healed. Yeah. Whereas the people of Nazareth are like, you know, who do you think you are? The, generous, the people of Genesis are like, we believe you are who you say you are. And they're bringing people out on beds. I mean, they're, they're, they're rolling their sick and their diseased out to Jesus uh, in hopes that he could pass by um, to the point where they could reach out and touch him like the woman we read about in Mark 5. Um, and, and Jesus is able to do um, a lot of great work there. They crossed over. Um, he's immediately recognized. The folks begin to bring all their sick to him wherever he was. Wherever he went, the villages, the cities, the countryside, they all laid their sick uh, and they over to him and they begged Jesus to come near. And as many as touched him were made well. And in Nazareth, Jesus can do very few miracles since there was no faith, but in Jim Nurse said, people flocked to him with their injured, with their sick, and he's able to do many great things among them. And at the risk of oversimplifying application, it's like, golly, we need to make sure we're more like the second people than the people of Nazareth, right? And sometimes the more we think we know Jesus, the less accepting we are of who he really is. Um, weren't they going to Bethesda or whatever it was? Bethsaida. And how did they end up in yeah. Gennesaret? Yeah. So, I mean, a long Sorry, story short. That. No. Long story short, Mark, probably not great with directions. It speaks <laughs> in very general terms. Um, that's one of the things that comes up when people are just like, I don't know if. I'm buying all this uh, is a geographic. He speaks in very general terms. Um, the other thing, if I can find it real quick to remember this, um, and he got in a boat with them, and the wind ceased. There sounded um, the other gospels make it sound like as soon as you just got in the boat, the wind ceased. They ended at their destination in a kind of a miraculous way too, um, which is another factor. The wind was against them. That was the other thing, I think. Maybe they just got pushed off course. Making headway painfully, the wind was against them. So that, that could justify why they were there. I don't know. Yeah, just we have to wrestle with it a little bit, because there is a little bit of a sense where it's like, it seems like they were in Bethsaida, according to John, because John's asking Philip who was from Bethsaida about where they could go and buy food, the feeding of the 5,000, but then it says they're also on their way. So it's kind of like, Either they get turned around. Is it from a general area, one general area of Bethsaida to the other? Um, yeah, there are folks recognize that differently. I don't really have a strong opinion on it. Um, but what is fascinating about these two kind of bookend stories is that it's the people of Nazareth who really think they know Jesus and yet are limited 
they put a scope, they put a lens on him that's that's so small, whereas um, there's this great faith that says you can do all things there in Genesis 11. And sometimes our, our own preconceptions, we talked about earlier about that, that Jesus box we can squeeze him into, um, our arrogance can limit what uh, he can do in our lives and the lives of the people we pray for. Like we have to recognize and understand he's all powerful, all knowing, all loving, sovereign and holy. And understanding his character and his will for us will go a long way, kind of receiving that power that um, our our big takeaway as we kind of glance back over this book at minimum should be to examine our faith in kind of light of these stories that we should examine the, the scope of our faith one of the temptations of our generation I think is to reduce faith um, to affirming the truth about God whereas I think Mark is very clear that faith is also maybe more so just as much about acting on that truth. That if Jesus is who he says he is, how do I live differently? Um, it makes a difference, right? If we really believe Jesus is who he says he is, he can do what he, we believe, we believe the scriptures say he can't do. Any questions about Mark chapter 6? It's a lot. It's a big book, a big chapter. Hand. Oh, <laughs> I saw a hand. hand. <laughs> <laughs> book. It's, it's interesting how yeah. the disciples are so um, sort of ignorant, hard hearted, that they don't get these things. You know, but at the beginning of chapter six, I mean, for Jesus to um, tell them to go out two by two and give them authority over unclean mm -hmm. spirits. I mean, that was a lot to give a bunch of guys that Don't just kind of didn't get it, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? And I think part of him telling them, you know, don't take anything with you, part of that, I think, might have been maybe some accountability on Jesus' part going, I'm going to keep you guys accountable. I'm going to send you out with anything, without anything. I don't want you to come back and tell me stories. I want, I want you to actually go and do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And again, you know, the other gospel writers are a little more gracious in the picture they painted the disciples. None of them painted the disciples as the hero, but you know, part of me just likes to think that Peter just told Mark how it was, uh, very, very brash and straightforward. And we, you know, Mark, we just we missed it. We were so ignorant, and we just we were, we were looking after ourselves. We thought we were we were we thought we were taking over everything. We thought we were overthrowing. We thought we were going to sit on twelve thrones and the here and the now and so on and so forth. And we just missed it. Um, but again, we'll pick up next week more powerful teaching, more miracles kind of building up to, as we end in, in, in chapter 8, um, another profession. So, um, all right, there's a meeting here in a few minutes. So let me pray for us, then we'll go. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for who you are and what you've done. Um, we just pray, um, when we read this chapter, that we would be um, like the folks at the, uh, our response to you would be like it is here at the, uh, the end of the chapter. Uh, that we not get so familiar with you, like those folks in Nazareth, that we, um, that we don't stand in all of you, that we don't have faith, that we don't believe um, that you can do great things. But not, let us to be those who lay our prayers before you um, and reach up to you with faith, um, knowing um, that you are all powerful and all sovereign and all holy. Um, yeah, we just pray that you would um, go with us, watch over us, and keep us safe until we gather here next week. Um, we love you today. Praise for your grace in Jesus' name. Amen.